Hello Euro Squatters. Today we are going to take a look at the ideologies that are driving the 19th century in the post-Napoleonic era and the upheavals that will come about as a result. So as we take a look at these ideologies and upheavals, we have on one side, post-Napoleon and the Congress of Vienna, a bunch of reasserted conservatism led by the man, myth, and legend Clemens von Metternich of Austria. So Clemens von Metternich is trying like crazy to keep the status quo in Europe. But meanwhile, across Europe, there's all these new ideologies that are starting to dominate and starting to push conservatism aside. So we have classical liberalism, which is stressing faith in the Enlightenment, faith in science and human rationality. It's a primarily a political movement, but we also see an economic uh, factor there as well under uh, under capitalism, led by Adam Smith. And then we have nationalism, which is both political and cultural, which is starting to shake things up during, uh, thanks to the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era, which is showing people that the, uh, the people themselves deserve to have some power and deserve to start challenging the government and making sure that they are unified in a way that makes the government match its people. All right, then we also have the French utopian socialism that's going to start to develop uh, during the revolution of 1848 and then after, which is politically and economic. Then we have Marxist revolutionary socialism, a uh, far more dramatic and you could argue dynamic uh, socialistic movement. And then on top of that, we've got romanticism, which is primarily cultural and so we see the people starting to embrace ideas like their, their history as a nation, which uh, fuels into nationalism as well, and then saying that they, they've got this idealism uh, in, and it's going to funnel into all kinds of revolutionary movements. And then on top of that, we've got anarchism, far more dramatic and going to be happening as a result of some of the revolutions of 1848. So now, let's take a look at liberalism. So liberalism is going to come into being because of the American and French revolutions. In liberalism, we see the, idea, the ideals of representative government coming into play because the people are seen as sovereign and therefore the laws should be a reflection of their general will. So we get some Enlightenment thinkers thrown in that mix just in that previous statement. We saw uh, little John Locke and Rousseau thrown in there. We see ideas of equality before the law as well. And uh, we saw this codified into law in the American Constitution and in the French various constitutions that they went through, primarily in 1791 though, which was not very radical. Um, and then we have limited male suffrage. The liberals were not fans of universal male suffrage. That is a fallacy to believe that one. Instead, they wanted limited male suffrage. Only those with property, those that have a stake in society, that those that actually pay its taxes. All right, and then we've got freedoms of speech, press, assembly, with no arbitrary arrests, guarantees of habeas corpus, and then the doctrine of laissez-faire capital capitalism embodied by Adam Smith. So nationalism at this time is going to be uh, representative of the people that uh, see their nation as a great thing, partly because they've got this imagined or uh, cultural unity. Sometimes it's imagined, sometimes it's real, and so now they feel this unifying type of thing that's going on, primarily because of their commonality of language and culture. So for instance, they share the same religion, they share the same history, they're starting to embrace their history and say, you know what, this is really cool, we are far better in our French history, let's say, than the uh, Prussians are, or the Dirty Brits are, for instance, and so now they're embracing that and saying that now our government should be a reflection of how the people feel about their government and how they feel about their nation. But then uh, you've got people that are also starting to realize that liberty and nationalism go hand in hand at this time. So nationalism often becomes, uh, in a way, undemocratic and unliberal because it stresses national superiority over others, which is not really a liberal idea. Also, it stresses the national mission, like manifest destiny, for instance, uh, in America in the 1800s, particularly the 1840s and on. And then this kind of us versus them battle. So it's it goes synonymous with uh, liberty, but at the same time, it's often not very liberal or democratic. But still, nationalism is going to be a very powerful force that conservatives like Metternich do not want to see in existence. All right, but during this time, we're going to see what they call the dual revolution because both the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution are going to usher us into modernity because French Revolution is going to be political. The Industrial Revolution is going to be an economic revolution. And with this, we see 
that uh, before 1815, it was they were pretty much separate revolutions because the Industrial Revolution, as you may recall from some of our previous discussions, uh, was happening primarily in England as of the 1750s, but was not happening in France because they were having all kinds of issues. But after 1815 in the Congress of Vienna, this is they're they're going to start to fuse together, and so that we get this idea pr uh, first from a guy by the name of Eric Hobsbawm. He was the first historian to really put this together. Gives us the idea of the dual revolution, saying that uh, in in the French Revolution, we saw the demands of the sans culottes turning into socialist desires, saying they wanted things like the law of maximum. They wanted price controls and regulations. Then we saw the growth of the middle class at this time, who desired a liberal government, in which the government uh, was representative of their interests, and they had a voice in it in things like the National Assembly or the National Convention of France. And then uh, we'll also see that this dual revolution is... Uh, combining the political and economic factors of these things. So the politics of classical liberalism will fuse with laissez-faire capitalism to form what Eric Hobsbawm calls the dual revolution. All right, now we start to see that Clemens von Metternich is trying, like many others in Europe, many of these stuffy conservatives at this time, to keep the lid on things because we've got all kinds of problems. And Napoleon, even though, you know, until 1824, when he, before he dies, he's hanging out in, uh, in St. Helena. It's not like he's a threat, but still his idea ideas are a threat. His ideas are a threat especially to places like Austria. So the Austrian Empire had 11 different language groups at this time by, eight, by the 1830s and 40s and, um, and those are nationalistic interests that don't always like the German minority that is running their country. So Clemens von Metternich is culturally German but we've got Czechs, we've got uh, Hungarians, we've got uh, let's see Poles, all kinds of different groups of people uh, in in Clemens von Metternich's Austria. And so they are wanting their national aspirations and nationalism is dangerous because it will dissolve the empire and bring about war as well. So there are others like the Holy Alliance that want to try and maintain conservatism. On the left there, we've got Friedrich Wilhelm IV of Russia. And then in the middle, we've got Emperor Francis I of Austria. And then we've got the young Alexander I, of, uh, Tsar Alexander I of Mother Russia. And these countries are going to try and maintain a Holy Alliance because by the 1830s, Great Britain is going to remove itself from um, Clemens von Metternich's status quo system in Europe, as particularly they were turned off by this holy alliance. So they're going to t uh, turn away from Europe and focus on themselves in the 1820s and 30s, and that we'll see how they will have a very different kind of uh, reform movement than Europe will have revolutions at this time. Uh, but the holy alliance is trying to keep the lid on all of those revolutionary ideas. It's not going well at times, though, all right? because, for instance, in Prussia, 1817, 300 years after Martin Luther is going to challenge the Catholic Church and start to establish not only a, a separate faith, but also a, a version of German nationalism. Like, for instance, when he's publishing the New Testament in German, is going to be a huge accomplishment for German nationalism. And so you had a number of students hanging out in Wartburg in, uh, in 1817 who started saying that they deserved to have uh, a German nation. They wanted to have a unified Germany. Well, Austria didn't like that idea, and its stepchild, basically, Prussia, also didn't like that idea because they were afraid that that liberalism would turn into representative uh, government, and uh, Frederick William IV didn't want to see that. So they're going to issue the Carlsbad Decrees and start to clamp down on liberals and radicals and put university students and professors who are too liberal into jail for having their dirty nationalistic ideas. So really, they're trying to keep the lid on the nationalistic uh, cookie jar, and that's just not going to work, as we'll find out. And we'll see that first in Greece. So in 1821, the Greek Revolution is going to begin. Because in Greece, since uh, the since 14, the 1450s, after the fall of Constantinople uh, in 1453, the Ottoman Turks are going to dominate Greece, and they're going. I mean, this is a, a prime piece of real estate. You know, it's right there in southeastern Europe, and the Greeks are starting to hear some of the ideas of the French Revolution, and they like them, and so they're going to start to rebel. They're going to embrace nationalistic aspirations by forming secret societies. They have a commonality of language. They've got the Greek Orthodox religion, which unites them, and they're going to um, start to revolt in 1821. Now, the Turks aren't going to like that, and so at first, the conservative powers of Europe are also not going to like it. They're going to say, whoa, 
This is nationalism. This is liberalism. We're talking about representative government and unification and independence from the Ottomans. Even though we hate the Ottomans, we don't want to let that happen. So they're going to say no. They're going to clamp down on this revolutionary enthusiasm. But very quickly, the Greek rebellion is going to become a holy war, essentially, for many romantic Europeans who see Greece as the birthplace of Western civilization. And they start to think, this is our opportunity to see some cool liberal ideas happening and so many people are going to go volunteer to help fight in Greece. Now the great powers uh, then are going to say in 1827, all right well let's have an armistice, let's have a ceasefire and see if we can work this thing out politically in another Congress of Vienna style system, in the uh, Congress of Europe kind of system. And the Turks are going to say no! And so therefore the um, in 1827, the Russians are going to declare war on the Ottoman Turks, and the Greeks will finally have their independence by 1830. After being burned, raped, and pillaged, though, as we can see from uh, these lovely paintings here, particularly the one on the right by Eugene Delacroix about the massacre of Chios, you can see how ugly it is for the Greeks as they're getting massacred. All right, so now let's take a look at Great Britain and how they're going to embrace reform rather than revolution, which will not be the case for many European states. All right, so liberal reform is going to start taking place in Great Britain slowly but surely. All right, this is kind of a great testament of the, uh, the potential of the representative system, that it does not require a revolution, but reform can come slowly, but it does come. All right, so Parliament at this time, unfortunately, is very undemocratic. All right, we only have an 8% male suffrage at this time because in order to vote, you must be a propertied member of society. You must have property qualifications to vote, and you must, uh, you must, if you want to go to Parliament, you must be able to do it for free. So you're a volunteer representative in Parliament, which is kind of cool because that means you're not in it for the money, but also is bad because that means only the wealthy are able to go to Parliament and still make a living. So the government is dominated by Tories. All right, these guys are uh, landed aristocracy. They own lots of land. They collect rent from the peasants. Uh, they are, are dominating the system, and they are highly conservative. They're going to bring in a little thing called the Corn Laws of 1815, making it, even though it's about corn, even though it's called the Corn Laws, it's really about wheat. I don't know why they do it, yeah, but still. So the wheat situation is uh, making it so that it's actually cheaper to import grain from somewhere else at this time, uh, from Europe. And so the Tories are like, well, wait a second, that starts cutting into my paycheck. And so they say, no, I don't think so. I'm going to issue the corn laws to make sure that everybody has to import my grain. And I'm going to keep the prices nice and high. Well, the people didn't like that. They started to protest. And so uh, there, was, there was all kinds of... Uh, uh, desire for liberal reforms, like allowing the people a voice in Parliament. So Parliament is going to pass the six acts, which is going to control the press and disallow freedom of speech. It's going to eliminate mass meetings uh, and then also impose a new stamp tax. I don't know if this sounds at all reminiscent of, say, you know, the 17, 1756 through 1776 and the new American colonies, but I'm just going to say that the Brits should have seen some rebellion coming. So the Parliament is hoping that all will go well. Well, the workers are going to decide to assemble at a place called uh, uh, St. Peter's Park. So they're going to meet at, uh, at Peter's Park, and uh, there's going to be a little battle that's going to take place. Because even though these men, women, and children were gathering on a Sunday peaceably, uh, the, uh, the guardsmen are going to be called out, the cavalry will be called out to run these people down in what they called the Battle of Peterloo. So, uh, I mean, you can just see the dirtiness of Parliament, and uh, people will, will make a big deal out of it in order to galvanize public opinion against these conservatives, which helps the liberal industrialists. So these guys are the Whigs. The liberal industrialists are going to start to bring in a new reform bill called the Reform Bill of 1832, hoping to do things like eliminate rotten boroughs. Rotten boroughs were places that were electorates where people no longer lived. All right, so, uh, so British history has changed, population has changed significantly over the last century because of the agricultural revolution. People are leaving the countryside and moving to big cities like Manchester. So we see this dramatic change in population in which in some districts there are actually no voters to vote and send pr uh, parliamentary members to parliament. And yet, uh, they still get elected somehow. Hmm. Titillating. That sounds a little bit controversial, corrupt, if you will. And so the liberals are going to bring in a reform bill to eliminate rotten boroughs and expand voter suffrage and make it a 50% increase of suffrage. So that brings us all the way up to 12%. 
male suffrage if my math serves me correctly, which it could be flawed. And so you can see that uh, it's a greasy pole here. It's not easy to get reform for uh, those liberal parliamentarians because the conservatives uh, try to block everything they do, and they're quite good at it because they've got the money to do so. But things are starting to change. The people are starting to uh, to get excited about this stuff. So we've got what's called the Chartist Movement. All right, so the Chartist Movement is going to demand six points. Uh, their six points is what they're, they're going for here. In their, in their platform. First of all, they want universal male suffrage. Um, they want to see a people's charter. And in this people's charter, they want to see universal male suffrage. They want to see a, an anonymous written ballot rather than, you know, voting unanonymously, which can be very bad for your, your work if you vote for the wrong person because your employer will find out. And then abolition of property qualifications for voting. They want to see payment of parliamentary members. That way it's open to talent and not just those with wealth. They want to see constituencies of equal population um, uh, sending, uh, er, er, uh, so they want to see equal representation, excuse me, from constituencies. So meaning that we, we are able to send more representatives to parliament and these will be done annually. So annual elections to try and ensure that the people's voice is always being heard. Well, uh, so this, these calls are not all that radical and they're not going to get what they want, unfortunately. They're going to get shut down. We will not see universal male suffrage until later in the 19th century in Britain. But one good benefit that we'll see is uh, a backlash against the Corn Laws and finally the repeal of the Corn Laws, as well as the 10 Hours Act, which is going to limit the hours of women and children that are working in factories to only 10 hours a day. Not bad. Now, as we see, this will be dramatically different from the situation in France in, the 18 in 1830, 32, and 48, because we'll see a lot of revolutionary activity then. So the reason that we start to see revolutionary activity in 1830 is because Louis the 18th, the restored Bourbon monarch after the revolution. Remember, he scampered away in 1815 when Napoleon had his hundred days. This guy's a total wuss. No one really likes him, except the royalists, and even they think he's an idiot. All right, so the, he's going to allow the Constitutional Charter of 1814. Now, he saw this thing as a gift to the French people. He's, it's like, oh, yes, I guess I'll give you these benefits. So in the gift to the French people, he's going to allow the middle class and the peasants to keep their gains from the French Revolution. So that makes him happy. But he's, and he's going to allow some artistic and intellectual freedom, also making them happy. And then he's going to allow a representative parliament. It's called the, uh, the Chamber of Peers and the Chamber of Deputies. So there's no estates, but the Chamber of Peers is a hereditary institution, and it means they got to have wealth to do it. And then the Chamber of Deputies, which is based on elections, and anybody uh, of talent is open to go into it. So yay, we see some changes. The problem? The electorate is tiny. Out of 30 million people, only 100,000 people, notable people, are able able to vote. So that is roughly 0.3% of the population for the electorate. Not very good. And so many of the Frenchmen are not loving Louis XVIII or his charter, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a tenuous balance between love and hate at the moment, and what do we do about it? Well, Louis XVIII is going to kick the bucket, and in comes Charles X. Now, this guy is a supreme reactionary and conservative. All right, so this guy is going to come in for his coronation at Rheims Cathedral. So, I mean, Napoleon crowned himself uh, emperor at Notre Dame. He's like, hey, I'm shaking it up here. I'm going to crown myself, and I'm going to do it at a different Different church, but Rems, as you may recall from our discussion, is a, is the is the place where traditionally, all the way back since the war, uh, the Hundred Years' War. Um, between Great Britain and France when we saw Charles VII crowned at Rheims Cathedral. This is where the traditional monarchs of France are crowned. And so he's going to crown, be crowned uh, in the courtly, ostentatious pedantry of the Ancien Regime. So this guy's a tremendous tool, and the ultra-royalists love him because he's going to repudiate the Constitutional Charter, and uh, he'll do this in July of 1830, and he'll do it in, by first outlawing the Chamber of Deputies before they're able to meet, and then pushing out the Chamber of Peers as well well and just saying I'm going to rule as an absolutist because that's what we do. All right, and so that's going to lead to three glorious days in which they're going to form all kinds of barricades. Hundreds will die in the streets fighting with the National Guard. They'll bring back the French tree collure and fly it proudly as they fight against this restoration of the Ancien Regime. Well, uh, Charles X is going to end up losing his spot in the government, and in comes Louis-Philippe. So Louis-Philippe is going to come in saying that he wants to reestablish the Constitutional Charter, bring back the revolutionary tree couleur, and that he is merely the king of the French people. In order to make himself look pretty cool, too, he's going to bring in a, uh, a restored cult of Napoleon. So they're going to take Napoleon's corpse, or you know, what's left of it, 
since it wasn't fully intact, if you recall our conversation. Uh, he's going to bring back Napoleon's corpse and uh, from St. Helena and put it into the Invalides, which was once a Napoleonic soldier's hospital, and they're going to entomb him there with all kinds of popular enthusiasm, hoping that this will make him cool with the French people, who uh, were big fans of Napoleon, especially after they saw what happened with Louis XVIII and Charles X. Now, he is going to uh, increase the vote uh, by 70%, which brings it up to 170,000 people people voting, uh, but the problem is that's still only a .6 electorate. All right. Secondly, he's going to allow total bourgeois control of the state. There's really no ab availability for the poor or the working class to have a voice at this point, and so they were the ones that fought in the streets. They will feel incredibly betrayed. Now that's going to lead us to another rebellion, glorious rebellion, in which we see the June Rebellion of 1832, and we get Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. So this is all going to get started in, in June of 1832 because of the death of Jean-Maximilien Lamarck, who was a Napoleonic general who, after the restoration of the Bourbons, he was still used by the Bourbons as a general to defend the state, and yet he still criticized the heck out of the Bourbon restoration, especially Charles X. So he was the the voice of the people from the streets trying to look out for their best interests and when he dies many of the people be believe that now is the time now is the time to start a revolution to restore the people's voice to france so let's take a look so now that we've seen all of that glorious enthusiasm from 1830 and 32 the french revolution of 1848 is going to be a tremendous uh, impact as well. So the causes of this revolution, we see through bad harvests, first of all. Uh, we also see unemployment in the cities and pre-revolutionary outbreaks where workers are going to take to the streets to demand better conditions. Now, you might notice this still looks very familiar to 1789 in France. And so uh, Louis Philippe, though, is not going to deal with it much better than the monarchy did in 1789. So we've got Louis Philippe being criticized as the bourgeois monarchy, who's doling out gifts to uh, the, the bourgeoisie, doling out gifts to the, the, uh, the banking class and the merchants, but doing nothing for the working class. And now, uh, he's going to get a lot of bad press, a lot of propaganda against him. And Louis Philippe, it was highly sensitive to public opinion, uh, did not like being criticized. And so he will actually abdicate on February the 24th of 1848. And so that will establish a provisional republic waiting for elections to happen that will come in April. So during the time of this provisional republic, it's dominated by a 10-man committee led by a guy named Kevin Yock, and uh, they're going to propose that we bring in a second French Republic. So the second French Republic comes in using universal male suffrage, which gets dangerous, as we'll see, because the working class is pissed, and they're going to vote for people that are going to look out for their needs. So these guys are actually going to vote for people that want to attempt socialism, like Louis Blanc. Louis Blanc is going to come in and demand a socialist right to work, meaning you know, if there's not enough jobs for the people, the state has the responsibility to form jobs for the people. So he's going to come up with an idea called the National Atelier's, saying that we need to create uh, national workshops in which the people will have a job every day, guaranteed, and the state will help fund that. The problem? Often there's nothing to do, okay? So they're going to, uh, uh, you know, the, the goal is, hey, let's, let's build things in France. But honestly, a lot of the time it's going to be them moving rocks or breaking, breaking bricks and uh, doing very little else and getting paid for it. So you can imagine that the upper classes and the middle class is going to hate this. They're going to become increasingly alienated from it. So in the April elections, uh, which has universal male suffrage in it, the we're going to see a clash of ideologies in which the middle class, some of them will side with the, the working class, but for the most part, they're going to start vacillating more towards the upper class interests than the former aristocrats. We're going to see literal violence taking place as this is going on too, because uh, it, the elections are going to get so violent that in June, uh, we're going to see Cavagnac close down the national workshops, start to take on dictatorial powers, and restrict the press. And so therefore, the people will take to the street again. And they, uh, according to historian Mortimer Chambers, he said that the barricades became the people's voice. And when blood was shed, the crowd had its first martyrs. Oh, beautiful. So hundreds are going to die in the streets. Violence all over the place. The National Guard will put down the working class, but not without them sending a message to the government that we want something new. We want someone 
different, and that someone will be Louis Napoleon. Now, Louis Napoleon is the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. He's got a killer mustache, too. I mean, holy crap, look at that thing. And so the man uh, is, is trying to make a name for himself. He'll do so first by staging a coup in Strasbourg in 1836, and then again in 1840. So he'll be put on trial for his attempted coup, uh, for treason, and while on trial, he's going to say, I represent before you a principle, a cause, and a defeat. The principle is sovereignty of the people. The cause, that of the empire. The defeat, Waterloo. The principle you have recognized. The cause you have served. The defeat you want to avenge. Oh, as if you could get cooler than that, right? Now let's take a look at the Austrian Revolution of 1848, or the attempt at it anyway, because in the Austrian Empire, remember this is a very uh, divided empire, really. Even though it's the second largest state in Europe and has the third largest population, it has 11 different language groups in it. There's a lot of people that are easily ticked off by the idea of liberal liberalism uh, in Austria because Clemens von Metternich is still the guy that is helping run the show as the diplomatic minister, and the Emperor Francis is not wanting to see any kind of nationalism either because that would divide the realm. Well, that's going to start happening, first with Hungary. So the Hungarians are hungry for some nationalistic reforms. They want to see greater national autonomy. They want to be essentially separate within the kingdom of the Austrian Empire, and they're a big group with Budapest as their desired capital. They also want to have full civil liberties, and they want to have universal suffrage. These are terribly liberal, and uh, even beyond liberal, kind of radical ideas. And so the intellectuals of Hungary are, are making some noise, but then in the spring of 1848 in Vienna, we've got students that are trying to say that we need a, not an absolute monarchy, which at the time is fairly weak, our absolutist monarch is not doing a very good job, and they say, let's bring in a constitutional monarchy, which people like Metternich hate and do not want to see. Also, we have the peasants who want to have guarantees of land. They want to be freed from serfdom, because still, in Austria at this time, uh, they were serfs. And so they are saying, we should be made peasants, we should be able to own our own land. Then we've got the urban educated, which uh, means that we've got uh, uh, classical liberalism starting to spread into their ideologies, and they're starting to have uh, coffee house discussions about things like uh, sovereignty of the people and suffrage, and so those ideas are floating around. So the Coalition of March is going to get together, because once the barricades start forming in places like Vienna in 1848, Clemens von Metternich is actually going to run away. He's going to get into a carriage and take off and try and find asylum elsewhere in Europe, while meanwhile, the, uh, the royalists that are going to stick behind will try and form a coalition of marches, they called it, to try and stop this revolutionary enthusiasm. So what they will do is they'll realize that they can pit one nationality against the other. For instance, the Magyars, the Czechs, the Poles, they don't necessarily love each other, so they're going to find ways to pit them one against the other so that it will divide their revolutionary enthusiasm rather than actually unite it. They'll also be able to uh, make some reforms by abolishing serfdom, which will make the peasants happy because now they're freed and now they have a chance to own their own land. And then the middle class, they're starting to hear some socialist ideas. So as much fun as classical liberalism sounds, socialism does not sound like fun, and that's where many of these students and uh, radicals are trying to take things. So they're going to support a coup led by Archduchess Sophia, who's going to establish her 18-year-old son, Francis uh, Joseph, as the king, the emperor of Austria, Francis Joseph II. Now, one of his key advisors is got, going to be a guy by the name of Bach. All right, I don't remember his full name. It's something long in German. But uh, Bach is going to be uh, setting up this plan almost immediately in which he'll have four occupation armies that are going to be kept all over Austria, not to protect from invasion, but to protect Austria from itself, to protect... Uh, uh, the Austrian government from seeing any more nationalistic uprisings, and they are a daunting presence. He is also going to uh, get rid of any kind of uh, freedom of the press, freedom of speech is going to be put the is going to be suppressed as well. He is um, also going to get rid of public trials, making it so that Roman law and torture are going to dominate here. And so, uh, so before there were some efforts, some desires for constitutional monarchies, and now Bach is saying it's time for us to go Bach to full out absolutism. <laughs> All right, so uh, that brings us to Prussia and the revolution of 1848. So there were many liberals in 
uh, quote-unquote Germany, since we don't have a Germany yet, uh, saying that we should unify as a state. This German confederation of the Rhine should unify with Prussia to form a behemoth, a massive super state of Germany. And at first, Frederick Wilhelm the Fourth is like, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. So he's going to pledge that he will allow uh, the German Landtag to meet in Frankfurt, which is a representative body, and they're going to discuss the possibility of a more liberal constitution with limited suffrage, German unification, and Frederick Wilhelm IV as their emperor. Now, the Frankfurt Parliament is going to get together and start discussing these ideas, saying they want a constitution and unification, and they want to go to war over a place called Schleswig und Holstein. So Schleswig und Holstein uh, are some areas that are in the north of the German Confederation. Denmark was trying to take them over, and they're saying, let's fight for nationalistic purposes to take it over, and then elect Frederick Wilhelm as our emperor of a unified Germany. Everything appears to be going splendidly, until well, Frederick Wilhelm is like, well, wait a second. You're saying you're going to elect me as emperor? I don't think so. I'm not going to take the crown from the gutter. Spit. All right, so uh, does not want to have the people elect him. Certainly not. That's far too liberal. He is a divinely appointed monarch. And then in 1850, uh, leaders in Austria like Bach and, uh, and Francis Joseph I and his coterie, uh, along with Russia, are going to convince uh, Frederick Wilhelm IV that he should renounce all claims to unification because that would upset the balance of power. So Frederick William IV is like, you know, I'm happy enough being the König or King of Prussia, so I'm going to keep things the way they are and renounce all of this unification bull jive. And therefore, the revolution fails. So what have we noticed about the revolutions of 1848? For summary, we see, first of all, when one thing happens, it spreads all over the place. So for instance, Clemens von Metternich was famous for saying at this time, when France sneezes, Europe catches the cold. And we started to see that happening in 1848. Ironically though, the revolutions of 1848 actually happened in Italy, in the Italian states, and not in France, because there were many that were liberally starting to say, for instance from Sardinia and Piedmont, that they want a liberalized constitution, and they want to start to see greater reform, and maybe even unification. That's going to spread into France, and then when France gets the sickness, then Austria is definitely going to it, as will the German Confederation and Prussia. So first it starts from January to May in Italy. Very quickly it spreads to France. Then in March it spreads to Austria. And then uh, again in March into uh, 1840 in, in Prussia. And so the the lesson here is part of the reason that all of this is happening so rapidly in Europe at this point is because uh, a lot of commonalities between them. First of all, there's a greater desire for political freedom. There's a lot of class conflict. There's socialist ideas that are floating around that's, uh, that's, that's breeding much of this conflict. There's also this reflection of the failures of restoration from the Congress of Vienna. Uh, and there's the effects of a generation of social change. The French Revolution changed things. It was a watershed in European history. Even though ultimately it failed in many ways in France, and then we saw the restoration of the Ancien Regime temporarily, it still started some ideas that cannot be taken away at this point. And then we see rapid information exchange, such as with technology. So uh, at this point in the game, we've got the telegraph, which is going to spread messages across Europe uh, very, very quickly and get revolutionary enthusiasm going, but also stimulate monarchs to help prevent revolutions from getting close to their borders. And so we also see where the authorities are starting to realize that, that their power can embrace nationalism, that they should embrace nationalism, and they should wield popular opinion to support their ideas. Before, under uh, people like Metternich, or even under, uh, going back before the French Revolution with Louis XVI and previous kings of France, uh, they tried to use popular, they, or they ignored popular opinion. All right, you might remember the myth of, of Marie Antoinette saying, let them eat cake, could care less about uh, popular opinion. However, um, now they're realizing you must pay attention to it, but you can embrace it and use it to actually galvanize uh, the people if you use nationalism as the basis for your uh, method of getting things done. By late August of uh, 1849, all of the revolutions have been effectively suppressed. Some liberalism still remains, but mostly this is conservative victory here. So even though we had all this romanticism going into this, all of this idealism going into it. By 1848, we get a great quote from Trevelyan, who tells us that the revolutions of 1848 were the turning point at which modern history failed to turn. 
All right, there's a number of reasons. First of all, constitutions uh, based in classical liberalism had no wide support because it was primarily the urban middle class who were a minority in society at this time. They're around 10% of some of these countries like France, not the bulk of society. And so that didn't carry enough weight to convince the rest. Then we had the radical phases where the working class said, hey, you're going to change the constitution. Great. Give us socialism too. And that is going to alienate the middle class supporters, which they will increasingly start to vacillate over toward the side of the established authority. And then that will result in suppression. Then we've got the established authorities who really remain intact. Even though we get a new leader in France, for instance, with Louis Napoleon, or a new leader in Austria with France, Francis Joseph the, the first, uh, Frederick William just kind of stays there. Even though we get new leadership, they are still essentially the exact same ideas. There will be moderate changes, but not much, honestly. And then nationalism tends to divide rather than unite, as we've seen, especially with places like Austria. Uh, and so it's going to be the job of the state to harness the power of nationalism to start to unite. And we'll see that in the age of imperialism. Plus, we don't see any major intervention in favor of the revolutions themselves. So therefore, the revolutions of 1848 truly were the turning point in which we failed to turn. Thanks for watching.